Well, good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see you here as we've gathered to worship our great God. It's lovely to have the people who've returned from Israel and uh, had such a good time there. And as said, one of the places they went to, I presume, was Nazareth. Yes? Good. Uh, you would have seen the site, more or less the site, where Jesus in the synagogue actually sat down. So I'm emulating him uh, today. But it's great to be able to, to be back to, to worship God together. We're going to begin by singing the praise of the Lord with the, uh, with the opening hymn, This is my revelation. <coughs> Some of you, you probably can't see me, but I can still see you. 
Um, and I wonder today, how many words have you used this morning? Do you ever stop to think about the number of words some people talk more than others, of course? But, uh, yes, and I, I wonder, were they kind words or were they nasty? Did they help people or did they, what we call, hinder them because of what you said? There was once ten, I'm glad it's ten because I can count that using my thumbs and fingers, there were ten men on the road towards Jerusalem and they had a problem. They weren't very well and they didn't know what to do and all of a sudden this wonderful person called Jesus came by and they called up out to him, Jesus help us! And uh, it was very interesting that uh, he actually stopped to help them because they weren't very nice to look at because they were unwell. And Jesus said a strange thing, he said to them, I'm going to help you but you must go to the local priest to show that you are better. And they went and they were amazed that Jesus hadn't touched them or done anything, he'd just spoken and he had healed them. And then one of them came running back and he came back and he said wonderful words to, to Jesus. I wonder, do you use these two words? The words, thank you. Maybe because I'm getting very old, but it seems that today a lot of people don't say thank you like they used to. Younger people and older people, do you say thank you? Or do you assume, oh, that's a big word I suppose, that uh, everything is your right, you should be given these things, and so I don't need to thank anyone, it's I should have them. But this one gentleman came back and he said thank you to Jesus. And what did Jesus say? He said, hold on, there were ten of you. How come only one of you has come back to say thank you? Isn't that sad? There were ten, Jesus healed them, but only one said thank you. And I trust that you uh, get used to saying thank you to people sensibly for what, uh, what they do for you. And so, because it's such a, so difficult to say thank you, I'm going to invite you, after I've counted to three, to actually say thank you out loud. Alright, ready? One, two, three. Thank, thank you. you. That was pathetic, wasn't it? <laughs> Absolutely pathetic. Now come on, adults, at least we can do it if the, the young people are not interested. So here we go. One, <laughs> two, three. Thank, thank you. Let's always use those two words to thank people. And we are... Uh, we are very blessed, aren't we? And above all, we are to thank God. So shall we do that now? Let's just pray together. Our Lord and our God, how we thank you. We thank you for the bright sunshine this morning. We thank you for our lives. We thank you for our homes and our food. We thank you for our clothes. We thank you for the good things that we enjoy. And so forgive us so we don't say thank you, that we're alike those nine men who didn't say thank you to Jesus when he'd done so much for them. But we just ask that we would be those who say thank you and mean it. We thank you that we are here today, we are here to worship you and to sing your praise. And we thank you for what we have just sung as well. That in the Lord Jesus we can not only know forgiveness, we can not only know that uh, we have a, a reason to live because we live to thank you and to show other people your love, but we also look to the future when in the future we shall rise with you. What a wonderful thing that is, that you will come back and you will bring your people to be with yourself. And so we just ask that we will know these wonderful things today that uh, as we sung, we will be able to say, Now in Jesus I live, I will rise as Christ was raised to life. 
Forgive us all our sin, all those things that we regret saying and doing, and forgetting to say as well. And we just ask that you will be with us. So as we go through our time together, uh, here or in the young people's classes in a moment or two, we just ask that we will be able to say thank you for all your goodness to us. And in Jesus' wonderful name we ask it, and we're able then to say a prayer together that Jesus taught us, and it's uh, written in our order of service if you need it, we know it as the Lord's Prayer, and we say together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So it's good that we're able to do these things together. Um, I'm here, my name's Clive Anderson, if you don't know. Um, because our pastor, is, uh, Ben, is still uh, away. He will be back, God willing, leading us next Sunday when we can say normal service will be resumed. So I hope you'll join us there as well. So before the young people leave us, we're going to sing a wonderful thing that reminds us that we're special because God <coughs> loves us. I'm special because God has loved me.
this week. We just asked you to be with the treasure seekers and midweek meeting, the music practice, the ladies' prayer and Bible study, and then next Sunday when Ben is back with us, that we will indeed be able to rejoice over your goodness to, to him and Anne in their time away, and uh, we thank you for it. We also thank you for our prayer focus this week of Sarah Susans and Finn Duncan, and we ask, Lord, that you would be with them and bless them in all that they do. We think especially of Finn, as he has this uh, thing to join regarding uh, woodwork in, uh, in Oxford in <coughs> September. We ask that that five-year course will go well for him and that indeed uh, accommodation will be provided that uh, indeed he will be able to rejoice in your goodness there. We also thank you as we come, uh, even though it's staggering it's a week ago, we thank you again for King Charles III and uh, for all the positive things that have come out and the comments regarding that coronation service. And we do thank you for it. And we do indeed ask that you will bless the King and his family richly. We just ask that you would be with them, that they would remember that you are the one who has done all things well. And so we thank you for him. We pray for our Prime Minister and uh, for those in government and in opposition both national and local, we ask that you would be with them and help them as many things will have to be decided upon and take place. Again, we pray about the situations in the world that even in Israel we are going to be uh, told about uh, the conflict that seems to have some sort of uh, safety uh, or peace at the moment. We just pray that that would uh, be maintained, but also throughout the world, so many people suffering at the moment. Lord, have mercy on them, and have mercy on the leaders. Oh, blessing God, we just ask that you would be the one who would change the hearts. Again, we pray very particularly for President Putin. We don't know how much input he is allowed, or is he just a mouthpiece? We do not know, but we just ask that you would indeed stay in the hands of those who would like to cause violence and problems and become greedy for things they don't have. May they say thank you for all the things that you have given them and not covet other things. So we ask that you would indeed do things well. And it's also good that we can pray for ourselves. So in the silence for a few moments, let us just bring to the Lord the desires and the needs of our own hearts and minds. <clears throat> Again, we thank you, Lord, that even though we may be saying things to you all at the same time, you are so mighty that you're able to hear and to answer. So we ask that you would be pleased with the forgiveness of our sins to hear and answer these our prayers and our petitions. For Jesus' name's sake we ask it. Amen. Amen. Now even though Ben is away from us, we're still continuing to consider um, what's known as the Sermon on the Mount and we come today and it's written out there uh, Matthew chapter 5 verses 21 to 26 it's uh, again a very powerful thing as we considered last week uh, the previous verses to this so here we are in Matthew 5 21 where Jesus said you have heard that it was said to the people long ago you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. 
Therefore, if you are offering your gift to the altar, and then remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar, first go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, that your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. So we ask God to give us help in understanding uh, that reading. And before we come to, to consider it, we're going to sing, Blessed is the man, the man who does not walk <coughs> in the counsel of the wicked.
son, and I'm going back quite a number of years now, of course, to when I was 17 and onwards, and I wonder what has happened to all those uh, young men that we had, you know, boy, uh, Junkos that I was with, and uh, often think about them and pray for them, and remember the things that were going on. It was such a, a, a sad time as well, one of the boys who was there, his young brother died in a tragic circumstance. He lived opposite where we were uh, in the church, in the flats, a place called York Hill. And unfortunately, his little brother was out playing with his toys and didn't realise that uh, what we call the dustbin lorry, uh, as it reversed, it killed him. And it was very uh, powerful when I was 17, 18 years of age to be asked to pray for this this situation because it was uh, obviously very difficult. But it reminds us that uh, we have these things throughout life, don't we, we have to face. So we pray for our young people that they do indeed know the blessing of the Lord in their lives. And I hope that many of them will end up to uh, becoming youth leaders wherever they are as well. So after that preamble, let's turn to Matthew chapter 5, and I've called this, I say to you, uh, because it's something that comes from, uh, from now on, uh, and, uh, through, very powerfully, Jesus kept saying, uh, uh, I tell you, I tell you that, you'll see that, but I say to you, it's something that he has said. Now the Sermon on the Mount, we call it on the Mount, those who have been there will know it's not a mountain, but uh, in all probability, it may have been, but I doubt it. But the Sermon on the Mount is the largest and fullest sermon that is recorded in Scripture, um, in, especially in regard to our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we may think that, uh, uh, say, something like in Deuteronomy, uh, we have all that teaching of Moses that goes on chapter after chapter. But here we have here this wonderful Sermon on the Mount that Jesus preached. And I'm sure he re repeated it, maybe not in, in a block, but in, in sections throughout his ministry in different places. And it, he would go and he would say these powerful things to people, I say to you, because I want you to hear what I'm saying. I want you to take it on board. And I tell you, the emphasis we are getting is Jesus' authority. What right had he got to stand up and say anything to anyone? Well, it was obviously in the, uh, in the popular word, in a charismatic sense, that he was very attractive to people. I think he probably had the most wonderful voice of all, and it would have been glorious to hear him speak. And we are told we will all hear him as we've been singing on the day of uh, his return, because he will speak and the dead will rise, and it will be through his word. So Jesus' authority, he's giving a, a particularly at the moment, what we're looking at, uh, moral principles to live by, that we should be those who are moral people, that live in a right way and live for him. And he contrasts that very clearly, as we saw in verse 20, and also as we go through, a group uh, of leaders called Pharisees and Sadducees and uh, the scribes, the teachers of the law. Um, he sets himself up over their misinterpretations. They have taken uh, Moses' words and uh, have twisted them and have added to them things that they should never have done. And so uh, Jesus is saying, well, you listen to what they say, but now I'm telling you. You listen to me. And that is a, a very powerful thing. He, uh, he provides clear, powerful teaching. Teaching that hurts if we take it on board because it really does cut to the quick, as we sometimes say. It's teaching that challenges and permeates the mind and hopefully will change people's behaviour <coughs> as well. It's not good thinking that just because we say it, few things that we're going to be okay. No, we've got to prove that we love God. Do we do so? 
and prove it to God above all, not to anyone else, but other people should see in the change in which we live and the way we live, that we are those who uh, do indeed follow him. I think it would be good to, uh, to remind ourselves of the general outline of the Sermon on the Mount. The Lord Jesus is concerned to describe the citizens of the Kingdom of God. If you are a member of the Kingdom of God, what do you like? And what will you be like? What should you be like? What should we be like? How do we live? And uh, we've been going through some of the things that have been taken us through. So we saw in verses uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 to 12, which is known as the Beatitudes. Those things that show that we are indeed those who follow the Lord and the way the Christian. Uh, should be and in effect are those who live those things out. We know the truth of them. We are those who are sorry for sin. We mourn because of our sin. But we long to see God. That we would uh, indeed be His. And we get a lot of practical teaching uh, as uh, we mentioned particularly last time uh, in verses 13 to 16. Jesus using the the illustration of salt and light. You may not understand some things in the New Testament, but you can understand, I hope, salt and light. Uh, what it's used for and why we need it. And then we saw that Jesus challenges uh, uh, people with the concern, a right understanding of the law of God. The law and the prophets. So he mentioned last time those two law and the prophets, and we consider how often it comes across. It's like on the, the road to Emmaus, on the resurrection, uh, the day of resurrection that Jesus met too, and he discussed with them what was, had been going on, and then he revealed to them what was in the law and the prophets, those things concerning himself. Isn't that interesting? Now, many people say, oh, I wish I'd been there. Uh, why wasn't it recorded? Well, it has been recorded for us. We can read the Law and the Prophets for ourselves. If you can read the English version of the Old Testament, it's all there. All about the Lord Jesus. And every time we read the Old Testament, we should see that. that. And we should ask God to, as we pray, Lord, reveal the Lord Jesus to us. Show us something about Him to us as we read these wonderful things. And so the law on the prophets, and he kept on about saying in relation to himself. And we see that little phrase, law on the prophets, in relation to the Lord Jesus, is repeated in the, the New Testament. And uh, I won't go back over what we looked at last time. But now we've entered, it almost looks like a, a new section. Here we are, in ver from verse 21, uh, right the way through, and Ben will take us through the rest of it, I'm sure, to chapter 48, to the end of the chapter, that Jesus will be at pains to stress the Christian's righteousness. The person who is in, who says they are a member of the kingdom of God, they should be seen to be very different. Look at them. The language they use. It's not just thank you, it's the things they don't say things we don't say and use. It's also the way we live. And it, uh, and it's a great contrast again that as we go through we will see that it is made with the scribes and the Pharisees. And we get that in verse 48. When we get there we will see that. Um, because Jesus says be perfect therefore as your heavenly Father is perfect. So if we say we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven, if we say that we are Christian people, we have to emulate God. We have to try and live as He is. He is perfect. Now we have to confess that we're not this sign of glory, but that is what we should be striving for, that we should be those who live for Him. And uh, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. 
And that is why we need the operations of God, the Holy Spirit, within our lives. If we are a Christian, we are told in Romans chapter 8 very clearly that the Holy Spirit has entered you. You are a changed person. You are truly a charismatic person. That is uh, the word that is used, particularly in Romans 8. The charisma of God is the gift of eternal life. The charismatic life is the gift of God. And that is what we should all live for Him. And so the Lord Jesus um, presents us with this contrast with living in the world to living in the kingdom of God. And he does it in a most interesting way. We are not in a competition with each other. I'm glad we're not, because I would fail. I've failed so many things in my life, and uh, you, I'm sure, do so much better than I do. Uh, I can actually just about remember sitting exams at school. It was always a waste of time for me. I don't know why it was in school uh, when we sat at, at, at exams. It was the hottest day of the year and we were required to wear full uniform, tie, jacket and also uh, if we were outside, if we were allowed to go outside for some reason we had to wear our caps. I don't know how many of you wore a cap. I always got threatened with a cane because I um, have a cap on and ridiculous, but there we are. Um, those, were the, those were the good old days, really. But um, it's amazing, isn't it, that we're, where we are. So Jesus says in chapter 5, 16, which we've already seen, that uh, as we are those who say we are God's people, let our light shine so that others may see your good way works and glorify your Father in heaven. You'll see how often Jesus mentions his Father in heaven. How often he relates everything to his Father in heaven. Glorify his Father in heaven. That's what people should do. They should see what you are about. And so the question has to be asked, and we can only answer it for ourselves, are we living examples of God's greatness and glory? Are we being changed, as John Wesley, uh, Charles Wesley put it in the hymn, from glory to glory, till in heaven we see his face? We are not to look around and think, well, I'm better than they are. No. Have I have someone who the Holy Spirit is working in? Have I a Holy Spirit-controlled life? Or am I someone who is not under the control as I should be? We should all be attractive for Jesus. I don't know how attractive you are. You all look wonderful on this day. Um, you probably had a, a wash, I assume. Um, and maybe you're wearing some sort of uh, aftershave or perfume or whatever it may be. All to make us look attractive. But are our very lives attractive to God? Are our lives attractive to other people? Or are we those who are those who are re repellent, we, we drive people away instead of welcoming the Lord into our lives. So we should be attracted to Him so that others, they may have more than we do, um, but others may say, what is the cause of your peace? What is the cause of the way you live? Why is it you appear to be attractive? Well, it is for the Lord Jesus' sake. We should so, in these difficult times in which we live, so live for Him that uh, we reveal peace and hope. We may not possess all that the world offers, but we should have a peace that passes all understanding. So, considering those things, just to move on slightly now, again, we are given more practical help here. We are presented with a practical example by the Lord Jesus that uh, sadly we are confronted with today, I hope never personally, but certainly in the news. And so the next example Jesus gives is the one of murder. What a thought. See how often. I don't know how many of you saw on the news this past week and they actually, I don't know if it was helpful or not, they actually uh, used the footage from where the 14-year-old uh, boy murdered another boy. 
But the, did you see that the knife he had was enormous? It was really long. It was on a, a piece of timber as well. And they actually sewed it. It was shocking. That poor lad who suffered, but also 14 years of age, to ruin your life like that. Well, Jesus says, murder, sadly, is in many places. And we are those who are to face up to these things. That uh, we are not to be those who do it. So Jesus says, you shall not murder. He actually says that, doesn't it, in our reading. You shall not murder. And then he will go on to say, well, I tell you, this is what you should do. So the sad age in which we live, this is a very real and a very um, awful example, isn't it? I often, I, I don't know, and I thank God that I don't know any, any people who have actually suffered this yet, but I often wonder how parents whose children have committed that crime, how they face up to it. You, know, you say, sometimes see in the, in the court or, or whatever, or outside, parents are there. I wonder how they feel and what they think. Often pray for those people who are caught up, as it were, in these things, but are not directly involved in it themselves. Oh, it's, a, it's a tough old thing, isn't it? Well, Jesus goes on to say about this, about murder. He says, uh, uh, murder, but uh, I'm going to expand it, he says, in verse 22. I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment against anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka is answerable to the court, and anyone who says, you fall, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Now these are really stuck, tough things, aren't they? What does he mean if anyone is angry? Are you angry with anyone here today? It's a, a good thing if, uh, if you're not, of course. But if you are, get rid of it quickly. Uh, do away with every anger, in, anger thought in your heart and mind. Do we re realise that anger is so deadly? Have we ever thought about it? We ought to read the Bible to see how deadly anger is. Um, and he, he uses the example, of course, as brother or sister. And that reminds us of Cain and Abel, right at the start of the Bible. Anger, so Cain murders Abel. And we are told in the scriptures that the blood of Abel pleads, as it were, to heaven. What an awful thing. Notice uh, Jesus makes it very clear here, a brother or sister. And then he uses this strange word, raka. I think I pronounced it correctly, I may not have done, but raka. It was a very rude word at the time. Uh, strong overtones. Um, some versions of the Bible will use the word fool as well in, in this little section. Um, some of us may use that word, uh, but I don't think in the Bible's terms. Um, it's not just full, but it's empty-headed. It's someone, you may or may not need a brain scan, but there you go, to prove if you've got a, a brain. But uh, uh, there you are, you know, you, you have to be very careful of the things we say. And uh, the, the original that we're looking at here, Raka, reminds us, it's something to do with immorality as well. That you're really accusing people uh, of doing tough things in a bad way. It's having an attitude of contempt for other people as well. Uh, do you have contempt for others? Do you think that they're less than you? Well, be very careful. We need to be those who listen to what uh, Jesus says and not call anyone, uh, maybe jokingly, but it's best not to even use it there, worthless. No one's uh, worthless in the sight of God. Which according to the Lord Jesus, these things that were being said at the, his time when he was teaching were very terrible to, in the sight of God. So we may look at these words and say, well, what should I say? Well, the best advice is to 
don't say anything. If you're not sure about the words you say, the different words you say, have you ever examined them? Different words, you can, it's so easy today, if you've got a computer, you can just look at all the different words or phrases you use. You might be surprised to learn what is the derivation of them. You might be of those who have to repent for what you have said. So we need to be very careful, so it's much better uh, not to use any words at all than to risk our very lives in the sight of God. And it's something that is very, very powerful. We need to keep short accounts with each other. I don't know if we need to say sorry to each other, but also we need to say sorry to God for the way we live. So it's a good thing. I don't need to remember um, to say those two words, thank you, but also to say the word sorry and mean it as well. And Jesus says here, the way he is teaching here, you fall, uh, brings the great danger of the fire of hell. I don't know if you know, but you can check it out for yourself very easily by reading uh, the New Testament. That Jesus spoke more about hell than he did about heaven. Have you ever thought about that? He wants you to be aware of the danger of there is this place that you can end up in. Just because you think you're good enough doesn't make you good enough. That if you do not follow him, heaven is the way we ought to be aiming for or going for. And we need to lead other people to be very careful in what they say and where they say it. And so we need to say sorry for those things to God and to everyone else that is not right. And so we go on with it here. There's lots of practical teaching in our reading in verses 23 through 26. It's all about forgiveness. Forgiveness in different ways. Do we need to forgive others and do it soon? Do we need to do it before we bring an offering to God? Uh, I remember one preacher said this one Sunday. He said, well, before we have... They had seat to seat offerings. Before we, uh, we have the seat to seat offerings, is there anyone you need to say sorry to? Teaching on this, this passage. And he was surprised that several people got up and walked out. Um, I don't know if they came back or not, but they needed to go and to say sorry. Because it really hit home. And I wonder, does it hit home with us? This is practical teaching the Lord Jesus gives us. So, go and be reconciled. Obviously, it's a very serious uh, example that Jesus gives of those who uh, uh, they're really uh, upset with um, because they're talking about taking them to court. Do it while you're still together on the way. Don't let your adversary take you all the way. And so what Jesus is doing here is that he's challenging us all. We cannot, any of us, atone for moral failures. Whatever moral failures we've made, we cannot give enough to get God's forgiveness. Only He can do it. And so there is this, this um, contrast. Don't try and balance evil with good. You can't do it. If you've done things that you're ashamed of, well, you can't do anything, but God can. You should come to Him. <coughs> and follow him. Don't follow the teaching of the scribes and the Pharisees. I say to you, and that is what we need to take on board today, what Jesus says, and we are to follow it. Do we live for the Lord Jesus? What is our life built on? What is the foundations for our lives? What are they like? Shallow or solid? I used to work in the uh, structure engineering industry. We used to spend a lot of time, some companies I worked for, in what 
was known as underpinning because things that had looked fantastic, but you go there and you realize in a little test or two that they were in real need, real problems. I mean, uh, and people were shocked how much it cost to underpin things to actually make it stable again. Well, what are the foundations of our lives like? We cannot underpin our own lives, but we need God's help so that we build our lives on Him. Do we think that we doing the things we do are good enough? Good enough for God above all? Do we listen to the Lord Jesus? I say to you, He's very clear today, isn't He? I say to you, I want you to hear, I want you to follow what I do. Do we follow the Lord Jesus Christ? I think at the end of the whole of what is known as the Sermon on the Mount, it's a wonderful illustration that Jesus gives us, that even though you may not understand all the teaching there, some of these things you may think, well, I'm, I'm not really sure about that, you can understand the last illustration he gives us. Because it is, wise and foolish builders, do you build on the rock or on sand? Sand does look good, but it can be very treacherous indeed. And don't build on sand, because that will cause problems. You can build on sand, if you're clever enough, something called a raft foundation, which you lay down and floats, as it were, on the water that's there, because sand doesn't attract water so often. Um, but you need something better. You need the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to build on the rock of his words, not on the sand of the scribes and the Pharisees. So, who will we follow? Well, it's very clear, isn't it? I say to you, very grateful that Tony can hear me today, and he can sit so far away from me, so that's great. But uh, do we hear? Do we have, as it were, spiritual hearing aids in to hear what Jesus says to us. Do we follow him? May it be so, for his name's sake. Amen. So in a few moments time, John is going to come and lead us around the table of the Lord. And then if you're able to, um, if you can meet with us afterwards, just across the way, just go around to the right, and you'll find that there is the uh, uh, the hall and there's some refreshments there. But before John comes to lead us, we're going to sing together, the Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. May that be true of us, that we have heard him clear.
God's presence with you. When we love someone, what we want more than anything else is to feel their presence with us. Although now COVID lockdown is a fading memory, the enforced separations of loved ones show us very clearly that although emails and phone calls and Zoom are all very well, nothing compares to actually spending time with our loved ones in person. When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, they lost the presence of God. In the Old Testament times when the temple stood, the Holy of Holies was the place where God's presence was. And when the children of Israel were exiled from the Promised Land, they were rejected, not just from the land, they were rejected from God's presence. But, nothing worked out, but, God promised to be with his people again. And he fulfilled that, that promise in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ on earth and in the coming of the Holy Spirit. When our Lord worked this earth, he was the temple where God's presence was seen fulfilled. And of course at Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit, God's presence is with the believer. By that now, we read in the New Testament, Ephesians 2 tells us that we are built together to become a dwelling, a dwelling place in which God lives. So the communion service is a time to be still, a time to know who God is, and a time to seek His presence. So uh, we'll have a, a meeting of silent meditation in a moment. And uh, in that time, I invite you to commune with God and enjoy the blessings of His presence among each one of us. Because He is God, his, and we are His people. He's with us, however we perceive it. Whether we know how to feel and hear an inner voice, just a sense of peace, whether we feel a physical touch of God, or just a quiet joy in our hearts. So as we spend a moment to remember our Lord, the sacrifice He made, punishment that was due to us that he took to make us right with God. Let's also enjoy and give heartfelt thanks for the blessing of knowing his presence with us. So we'll have a minute's quiet meditation and then Bob and Chris will give thanks for the bread and the wine.
Just pray. Dear Lord, we remember you <coughs> when you hung on the cross in dreadful pain. Body broke, the scoffers cried. He cannot, he can save others, but he can't save himself. Yet those mockers spoke truth. He did save others who trusted in him. And he couldn't save himself because he willingly did his father's will and suffered death, even death on the cross. So we eat this bread, a staple food for mankind, and we remember the pain, the humiliation, and the weight of our sins borne by the Lord Jesus. And having our sins forgiven, God raised you back to life, satisfied with the price paid. We thank you that you will return to gather all who trust and believe in your saving grace. And we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We thank you, Lord, that since the coming of the Lord Jesus, God has come again to dwell among his people. Thank you that the kingdom of God is here among us, though not always visible. Thank you that one day Jesus will return and that every eye will see him. Thank you, Father God, that we will 
see him face to face and be with him forever. Lord Jesus, 